Okay, cyber friends, welcome back to this final video in the Practical Proceduralism series, and wow, what a journey it has been. Just good friends, proceduralizing together, you know, what could be better? Today we're taking a look at Alembic files. Some pros, some cons, gotchas, and tips for working with this popular format. So first up, what is Alembic even used for, and why would you choose that instead of FBX? Both formats support animation. They also both support cameras and hierarchies. The main difference between FBX and Alembic is the way that they structure their data. Alembics are what are referred to as a vertex cache format, whereas FBX has a more hierarchical and procedural approach. And while I do love proceduralism, there are many situations in which Alembic is the obvious choice. You can think of it this way. FBX is primarily for handling bones, whereas Alembic is more for skin. It's what you would want for something like a cloth or a fluid sim. Now you can absolutely export an animated character as an Alembic, but the thing is you won't be able to go in and animate it using the original rigs the way that you would be with FBX. You'd have to set that all up again, which is like just kind of insane if you do that. So as a general rule of thumb, stick to FBX for characters or anything with bones, and Alembic will handle all of your simulation stuff. One important thing to note is that in Houdini, Alembics don't support lights or materials, so if you need either of those things, you're going to want to go with FBX. Now obviously this is a bit of a simplified description, but for the sake of this tutorial I'm going to leave it there and just jump into Houdini and show you guys how you can work with them. So just like FBX, you can pull in Alembic in a couple ways. The most obvious of course being the file SOP, so let's take a look at that. File SOP, and grab this Alembic file. And just for context, this Alembic I exported from Cinema 4D. It's just a couple of cloners um, with some noise on the position and rotation. Standard rules apply here with the scale. We're going to want to transform this down to 0 0.01. Now if we middle mouse over this, we can see something interesting. We have this new object type, the Packed Alembic. These are functionally very similar, if not identical, to your standard issue Packed Primitive, so you can mostly think of them the same way. If you're not sure how packed prims work, well, get those fingers a googling. But suffice it to say that each little piece of geometry represents a single point and a single primitive. How bizarre. How bizarre. Now, as we know with regular packed prims, we need to unpack them to get all the data contained within. So if we drop down your run-of-the-mill unpack sop here, we can see that indeed we have way more points now, and also our handy vertex attributes of N and UV. If the Alembic had been exported with additional attributes, those would be visible here also. Great. Now another method is the Alembic SOP. So let's drop down one of those and we'll pull in our file. We can see that we basically get the same result, complete with Godzilla sizing. So we'll scale that down for clarity. Now the main benefit with the Alembic SOP is that it creates the path attribute, which is similar to the hierarchical info we get with an FBX. If we check the primitive attributes in the Alembic SOP here, we can see that we have this nice clean path attribute, whereas with the file SOP, we just have this big mess of groups, which is basically unusable. Also, if your Alembic has animation, which they usually do, you're going to need to use the Alembic SOP to access that, and it also offers some basic controls for the timing here. So long story short, always use the Alembic SOP unless you've got a very specific reason not to. Now. One kind of gotcha with both these methods is that after you unpack the Alembics, you still need to do one more step before you can enjoy full access to all this geometry. If we middle mouse over the unpack SOP, we can see that we have a bunch of points and a shit ton of vertices, but we only have 18 primitives. WTF, bro? Well, if we look closely here, we can see that we actually have something else. Polygon soups. So what the heck is a polygon soup? To be honest, I don't really know, and I don't really care. All I know is that they're annoying and I've never used them for anything, but now whenever Houdini is behaving badly, I always give a little middle mouse hover and see if I've got any poly soups in there gumming up the works. And you know what? Sometimes I do, and it bothers me. So, let's all say it together. Fuck poly soups. Okay, that felt good. Luckily, it's easy to fix. Just go into the unpack SOP and tick convert poly soup primitives to polygons. Alternatively, you can just drop down a convert SOP and the default settings will automatically convert that to good old polygons. Middle mouse hover and we can confirm that we are indeed back in business. 
Make sure you do this step if you need to edit the geo at all because most operations just simply won't do anything with polysoups and then you'll spend like 20 minutes rage googling to no avail before you give up and take a hot shower just to hide your tears and then suddenly you remember, oh right, motherfucking polysoups. And then the shampoo gets in your eyes so you end up just crying even more. Don't ask me how I know that. Okay, moving on. There's also an option in the file menu here to import an entire Alembic scene, and if your Alembic contains a camera or multiple objects, then you'll want to use this method. I've had several projects where I'm given an Alembic scene from a match move or a nuke artist that contains a track camera to work from, so this is actually pretty useful. I'm not going to go into the details of it here because it basically works the same way as the FBX scene import, and we already covered that in the first FBX video, so go ahead and check that out if you're so inclined, or just try it yourself. Honestly, it's pretty simple. So now we've got access to these polygons, let's mess them up. You can do anything with these now that you could with standard polys and they will maintain all of the OG stuff plus whatever you add to them, including their animation. If we do the standard mountain deform here, we can see that they still move the same way as always, except now they're all bumpy. Now here the cubes and the pyramids don't have enough geo, so let's subdivide just those shapes using the path attribute. So first, in the unpack stop, we need to transfer that attribute over to our unpacked geo. So let's grab it from the drop down here. And then let's drop down a subdivide and see how we can isolate just those shapes. So in the spreadsheet here, it looks like those shapes are separated from the spheres and all the way back at the beginning of the path here. So we can use that for our group. So we'll type at path equals slash cloner underscore one slash star. And this will grab everything from cloner one. So then we'll crank the subdivisions and now we've got some better deformation. Okay, so that's pretty cool, but actually one of the best things about Alembics in Houdini is the fact that they are packed objects. Check this out. If we drop down a copy to points and just put anything in there like a pig head and wire it up, bada bing, we instantly have swapped out all of our geo. Now that is super powerful if you think about it because all the different shapes in this sim have their own path attribute. So if we wanted to isolate or delete specific shapes, it'd be, it's easy to do. It's an art director's dream. We can see now though that the pig heads aren't rotating properly, but that's a pretty simple fix. We will need to, again, unpack our geo so that we can access the normal attribute. Now the N attribute by default is on the vertices, but in order for the copy to points to use it, we need to get it onto the points. So a simple attribute promote will work here, original name N, original class vertex, and now that's sorted. Let's drop down our connectivity stop here to give each piece a class attribute as per usual. And then let's put down an extract centroid stop. And what this handy little fella does is it loops over all of your geo in one of several ways and simply outputs a point at that object's center. And as we see here, it also provides an option to transfer over any attributes, which is perfect. So let's put N in there switch the piece element to point so it reads our point attribute. And finally, in the piece attribute drop down, let's select the class that we just made. Now if we look at our copy to points, we can see that we have restored the rotations correctly. Nifty. Okay, let's take this one step further. Remember when we were dealing with the FBX files and they included those handy dandy transformation attributes that we were able to convert into a matrix? Well, Alembics have a version of this too, and it's already in matrix format. If we select our original Alembic SOP and take a look at the primitive attributes, we can see that there's not much going on here. However, if we click on this intrinsics drop down, we can see that there is a huge list of intrinsic attributes. Now, what are intrinsic attributes? Well, again, outside the scope of this series, but in short, intrinsics are attributes that are hidden away from the user by default. The reason for this is that most of them aren't editable anyways. They're mostly just for Houdini to use internally to make sure it properly understands how to interpret geometry data. So you can think of them as geometry metadata. The intrinsic attribute we're interested in here is the packed full transform. So if we tick that little checkbox, it will display in our spreadsheet. As you can see, this is indeed a full 4x4 matrix for each packed object in here. Now we can't directly use this attribute, but there are several ways that we can access this data to use as we see fit. Now let's take a look at our unpack SOP again, and we see this checkbox apply transform. Untick that. Now we can see that all of our geo magically snaps back to the origin because Houdini is extracting all that shape data, but it's skipping the step of actually applying this packed full transform matrix to all the points. Now, if you remember our FBX process, this is really helpful because it means that we can easily swap out any geo that we want and just reapply that matrix. Let's see how we can do that. First off, we're gonna need a way to identify each piece. So let's get a connectivity swap in here. 
Next, we'll put down a blast stop and we'll just blast out a random piece. This will be the piece that we replace. We'll pipe that into a merge and in a separate chain here, we'll drop down some geo, let's do a pig head, and then an attribute create. We'll give this little piggy the same class value as the piece we blasted away so that we can just swap the instances using that attribute. Pipe that into the merge and then pipe the merge into a copy to points. As usual, we'll tick the piece by attribute box and switch that from name to class. So now we've got all our geo in the center, but we need to get it back to the original positions so that we can tell the copy to points where it needs to put everything. So we'll put down another unpack, but this time we will apply the transform so that the pieces are in their default positions. Transform that down to a usable scale. And again, we'll put down a connectivity stop so that we've got a matching class attribute in this chain as well, which as I'm sure you know by now, we're going to use but for instancing. Okay, so now here's a new node, extract transform. We can leave this at defaults because we only need position and rotation for this example, but if you need more data, this is exactly where you would select that. And let's set our piece attribute to be class in here. This node takes two inputs, the first input being the reference or untransformed geometry, and then the target geometry, which is the same geo but with transformations or deformations applied. The node is going to compare the difference between the untransformed and the transformed points and then basically recreate that transformation on its own based on the differences between the two. Then it's going to output one point per piece just like the extract centroid did, complete with all the position and orientation attributes necessary for the copy to points. So now let's wire that up and yep, we have one properly transformed pig head in the mix now. Wowie zowie. And the fun doesn't stop there. We can do whatever we want with these points. We can randomize the color or the scale or the orientation or all of those things. Be careful with the orientation though, as this can overwrite any animation in the Alembic. And because we have all these points, we basically have our own particles. And if you're not sure what I mean, all particles in Houdini are simply points. It's just the attributes you apply to them that make them behave like particles. What this means for us is that we can actually edit or re-simulate this geo right here in Houdini without the need to go back into our original software and export a whole other Alembic. Let's drop down a pop net and dive inside. In the pop source node, let's set the emission type to all points. And in the birth tab, in the impulse activation field, just type $FF equals equals one, which essentially means only emit particles on the first frame. And with the emission type set to all points, we're going to emit one particle per point per frame, which is one time, which effectively is just going to convert our existing points into particles. Now let's drop down a pop force, set the amplitude to whatever, something, and then a pop spin to give them some rotation. Tick this checkbox here and set the spin speed to something like 100. Now go up a level, hit play, and we can see that our points are behaving like particles. And now our pig head is moving and rotating right along with them. Now I'll be honest, I have never actually done this in production, but the point of this exercise isn't so much to solve an actual problem as it is to just get you thinking about the flexibility that's possible when you start to dig into the data here. Everything Houdini is data and it's basically a giant calculator. I mean, really most software is. The difference is with Houdini, it gives you so much access to the inner workings of just about everything. Alembics and most other softwares are just set and forget. You import it, you press play, that's it. If you need to make a change, you need to go back and export a whole other Alembic. But in Houdini, external files like Alembics and FBXs are almost like a clay sort of thing where you can reshape them, reuse them, extend them, etc. That's what I love the most about this software, and I think that once you have this kind of epiphany, that's when you truly understand what Houdini is at its core. Because everything else is dependent on this methodology. And this is what I mean when I say, think like Houdini. A lot of professional graphics work is just as much about solving problems as it is about being creative. And Houdini gives you the tools to get yourself into and out of just about any situation. And who does that remind you of? That's Harry Houdini, by the way. I'm not sure how obvious that is. Pretty slick how I tied that all together though, huh? High five. Okay guys, this is the end of this little series and I just wanna say thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, it's so great. I hope I've been able to teach you some of the fundamentals here and I'm already thinking of ideas for a new series. So hopefully I'll see you sooner than later. And until then, happy Houdiniing.